The book of Titus chapter 2, and we're going to continue our series on what the Bible says. And last week we talked about what the Bible said about the discipline of God. This morning we're going to talk about what the Bible says about the grace of God. Some say the grace of God. Aren't you thankful for the grace of God? Amen. Well, we're going to talk a little bit about the grace of God this morning. Many years ago, there was a guy by the name of John. Not this John, but another John. John grew up in an alcoholic home. He grew up in a, in a family that was just messed up. John's mom died when he was about 11. John was orphaned out for a little while, and then he went to, to, to live with his dad. John's dad was a was a Navy man. He was a, he, he, he was a sailor. And so at the age of 11, John began to, to, to sail with his dad. I mean, this is way back in the day. And so John began to sail with his dad. And as John began to sail with his dad, obviously those of you that know military, some military circles, and especially back in that day, uh, it was pretty rough. I mean, they, they drank hard. They partied hard. They did about everything that you can imagine that a military man back in that day would do. And so John, as an 11-year-old, he began to catch on to that lifestyle, began to drink, began to carouse. By the time he was 18, he was so bad that his, his own father disowned him. He got into selling slaves, and, and so he, he would, he, he would, he would ca capture slaves, and he would take slaves to England, and he would sell slaves in England. Well, as he, as he got older, he, he, he continued to, to go down and down and down into this, into this deep hole of debauchery. Finally, he got so bad to where he was not just selling slaves, but he himself became a slave. He sold himself into indentured servanthood. And so as a slave, he was on this ship one day, and as he was on this ship, they were sailing across the, the, the Mediterranean Sea. And at the last port, some Christians had come to him and given him some literature, and he took it, and he mocked them. And he, and he said, yeah, sure, I'll read it, whatever. And, and forgetting that he placed it in his pocket, when he got back to the ship, that next day he read the, read the material. So he had read the material, and he was out on this ship, and they were out on the Mediterranean Sea, and all of a sudden this storm came up. And as the storm came up, he was on the deck of this ship, and the storm was so bad that a huge wave came and it swept him off the ship. It swept him into the ocean. And as it swept him into the ocean, he began to pray. He began to call upon God and he said, God, if you're real, and God, if you can change my life, then I give my life to you. Well, miracle of all miracles took place. This is a true story. Miracle of all miracles took place. No sooner had he prayed that prayer, but another huge wave came and literally picked him up and placed him back in the ship. That day, John Newton was saved. And for some of you, when I said John Newton, you knew exactly who I was talking about because John Newton many years ago became one of the greatest preachers that this world has ever seen. As, as hard as he partied for the devil, he went after God. As hard as he went after the world, he went after God. And he began to preach against slavery. He began to testify. He began to, to do everything he could to, to, to free slaves from their slavery. And John Newton became a very famous preacher. And he wrote a song that said, Amazing Grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. Twas grace that taught my heart to fear. Twas grace my fears relieved. And today I want to talk to you a little bit about that grace. Because I think we as a church today, we know very little about the grace of God. And so today we're going to talk about what the Bible says about grace. T uh, Titus chapter 2, if you're there, say I'm there. Yeah. If you're ready, say let's go. let's go. Turn to your neighbor and tell him he expects you to talk to him. Turn to him and look at him and say, if you don't talk to him, it means either one or two things. Number one, you're mad, or number two, you're asleep. Now wake up. <laughs> Titus chapter 2, if you're there, say I'm there. Yeah. If you're ready, say let's go. let's go. The Bible says, for the grace of God, somebody say for the grace of God. 
I love this scripture. For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. The King James says, for the grace of God has appeared unto all men. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto all men. NIV says the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. And it teaches us. Some would say the grace of God offers us and teaches us. Do you see that? It offers us salvation and teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions. And to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives. Now, let me ask you a question this morning before we get into the word. Does that describe your life? Have you said no to ungodliness and worldly passions? And there are a lot of, there's a lot of ungodliness today in the world. And there are a lot of worldly passions that we must say no to. And he says, are you living a life that is described as self-controlled, upright, and godly? But that's what the grace of God does. It teaches us to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present world while we wait for the blessed hope. The appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Now this morning I want to begin by asking the question, what is grace? If I were to ask you what grace is, what would be your response to me? What did you say? Somebody down here said something. Unmerited favor. Somebody else said something else. Being in the blessing of God? Is that, is that what you said? Oh, God's riches at Christ's expense. Somebody's been to Sunday school. God's riches at Christ's expense. G-R-A-C-E. God's riches at Christ's expense. Somebody said God's unmerited favor. Anybody else? Mercy. Well, um, yes and no. Yes and no. I'll, I'll explain the difference between mercy and grace here in just a moment. Because I, I, mean, I think we all understand that in the Bible there are three big words, right? There's justice. Somebody say justice. Mercy and grace. And, and somebody said that grace, and, 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 and whoever said that, uh, that, that it was God's, God's riches at Christ's expense, you got an A-plus for the day, Lori, okay? And whoever said it was God's unmerited favor, you get an A-plus as well. Now, 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 let me explain to you these, these, three, the, these, these three big words of Scripture. Uh, there's, the word, there's the word justice. Somebody say justice. Then there's the word mercy. Somebody say mercy. Then there's the word grace. Now, let me explain the difference between justice, mercy, and grace. Uh, the word justice, it literally means you get what you deserve. How many of you know it's not good to get what you deserve? I was in New Mexico not too long ago. I was driving through an intersection at 55 miles an hour because I was on a 55 mile an hour highway. On the outskirts of Alamogordo, New Mexico, my wife doesn't know this, so this is news to you, honey. I'm on the outskirts of, Al uh, of, of, of Al Alamogordo, New Mexico, and I'm heading to El Paso, Texas, and it's 55 on the outskirts, and I'm just cruising 55, right? There's a police officer in front of me. He's going 55. I'm going 55. The guy next to me is going 55. The police officer, we, we come to an intersection. The police officer gets off to turn. I just keep cruising, 55. The guy next to me, he keeps cruising, and I'm cruising through the intersection. All of a sudden, I look in my rearview mirror, and there's the officer. And he has his lights on. And I'm like, guy next to me sure got it. <laughs> and then he pulls behind me. And I pull over, and he pulls over behind me. And I'm thinking, what's wrong with this guy? And he comes up, and he says, you were going 55 through the intersection. I said, yeah, we're on a 55-mile-an-hour highway. He says, it's 45 through the intersection. I said, not in Nebraska. And he said, you're not in Nebraska. So he gave me a ticket. I wish he would have given me mercy. But he gave me justice. Now, justice is getting what you deserve. Mercy is not getting what you deserve. 
of justice and mercy, I choose mercy. Come on. But I like grace even better than mercy because mercy is not getting what you deserve. Grace is getting what you don't deserve. Did you, did you see the difference? It's a slight difference. It's a subtle difference, but still it's a difference. Justice is getting what you deserve. Mercy is not getting what you deserve, but grace is getting what you don't deserve. I don't deserve forgiveness, but I got it. I don't deserve God's love, but I got it. I don't deserve God's, God's mercy, but I got it. I don't deserve heaven, but I got it. I don't deserve God's love and God's favor, but I got it. Hallelujah. I thank God that today I'm standing in grace. So that's the difference. When, and so, so when somebody says mercy, it's kind of like mercy, but not real. It's it, not really. It's even better than mercy. Some say better than mercy. Because, because mercy doesn't give you what you deserve, but then it gives you what you don't. Grace gives you what you don't deserve. I didn't get spanked. Instead, I got an ice cream cone. Hello, are you with me? And so, and so, and so this morning we're talking about what's grace. Somebody say it's God's unmerited favor. It's God giving us what we don't deserve. Now, the world doesn't understand this. Come on now, the world doesn't preach this. Let me, let me, let me, let me, let me prove it to you. Finish this sentence for me. There's no such thing as a free lunch. Somebody say free lunch. God helps those who help themselves. How many have ever heard that? Here's another one. You get what you Pay for. <laughs> but you get what you deserve. Somebody said, we make money the old-fashioned way. We earn, earn it. So what's, what's the world saying? The world is saying, look, you do. You make. You be. You prove. You work. And everything that you get has to be earned that's not what grace is all about. So when we come into the kingdom of God and we hear that God will forgive us, not because of what we do or what we don't do, but God will love us because of who he is and because of what Jesus has already done, we don't understand that. And so this morning, we're gonna, when we leave here, we're going to understand what grace does and what grace is. Are you with me? Now, there are three things I want to talk to you about grace. Number one, the grace of God saves. Somebody say saves. Number two, the grace of God strengthens. Some say strengthens. And then number three, the grace of God, what does it do? It saves, it strengthens, and then finally it sustains. Some say it sustains. So first of all, it saves. Some say it saves. Where do you see that? Look at verse 11. It says, the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all men. Some say it offers salvation. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, for it is by grace that you've been saved through faith. Some say it's by grace that I've been saved through faith. Come on, somebody say it. I, I, up in the balcony, are you still awake? John, John woke you guys up earlier, okay? Say it with me. It is by grace, balcony, it is by grace that we've been saved through faith. Not of ourselves, it's the gift of God. Look what it says here. Not by works, lest anyone should boast. You see, some people believe that we're saved by what we do. Some people believe we're saved by, not, by, by what we don't do. See, but can I say salvation is not spelled D-O, and it's not spelled D-O-N-T. Salvation is spelled D-O-N-E. It's not by what we do, it's not by what we don't do, but it's what Jesus has already done. When Jesus said it is finished, he meant it is finished, it is paid for. There are some people who say, you know what, you can get saved, but you got to come and you got to do. You got to come to church, you got to read the Bible, you've got to, now, now I'm not saying you shouldn't come to church, I'm not saying you shouldn't read the Bible, I'm not saying you shouldn't do some things, but listen, it's not what you do that causes you to be saved. You don't do anything to get saved, you do something because you are saved. Love the way you're shouting. How many of you know that, that, that works always follows faith? The Bible, the, the Bible tells us, James, James said, that we're not saved by our works. He says, but you show me your faith without works, and I'll show you my faith by my works. 
You say, we, 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 we're not saved by what we do. You're not saved, Michael, because you come to church. You're not saved because you go to youth group. You're not saved because you read the Bible. You're not saved because you sing songs. You're not saved because, because you, you, you memorize scripture. You're not saved because you do all the good things that a good young man should do. You're not saved because of that. And you're not saved because of what you don't do. You're not saved because you don't drink. You're not saved because you don't chew. You're not saved because you don't, you don't, you don't, you don't do all the stuff that everybody else. You're not saved because of those things. You're saved because of what Jesus has already done. You see, the Bible says that we are saved by grace. Some say by grace. What is grace? Lori told us. Grace is God's riches at Christ's expense. But the Bible says we are saved by grace through faith. Some say through faith. Let me illustrate it to you. God in his grace reaches down. He says, Don, I love you. Don, you're my son. Don, I'm going to do everything I can to bring you up to where I am. That's grace. Grace is God's unmerited favor. God came looking for you when you didn't want to have anything to do with him. God came knocking on your heart's door when you didn't. I don't know about you. I didn't want to have anything to do with Jesus. Come on. I was perfectly fine as a sinner. I like smoking my dope. I like drinking my booze. I like, I like running around. I like doing all that stuff. I didn't want to have anything to do with Jesus. But Jesus wanted to have everything to do with me. And so Jesus came knocking on my door. He came and the Holy Spirit came knocking on my door, just like he came to John Newton, knocking on his door by somebody handing him that, that piece of literature. And when the time was right, he called out and said, God, I want to have something to do with you now. Amen. Are you with me? Yeah. How many of you know that's faith? You see, grace is God's riches at Christ's expense, him reaching down his hand. Faith is man reaching his hand and taking the hand of God. If grace is God's riches at Christ's expense, then faith is forsaking all, I trust him. Right? Forsaking everything else. Forsaking my religion. You know what the problem with some people? The problem with some people is they're pressed and they're starched, but they're not washed. Hello? I said they get religion. And they get pressed and they get starched and they get all, all religious, but they never get washed. Listen, you got to get washed before you get anything else. And if you get washed, then you'll get some of that other stuff too. Are you with me today? And so, and, and so God reaches his hand down in, 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 in grace and man reaches his hand up in faith. And as man grabs the hand of God, God in his grace lifts man up from the muck and the mire and he places him on a solid foundation. That's what grace is all about. It's God working in us both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Oh. The politician says, legislate your way out. The military man says, fight your way out. The liar says, bluff your way out. The materialist says, buy your way out. The alcoholic says, drink your way out. But the Christian says, Jesus is the way out. And Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. By grace, I have been saved. Hallelujah. Thank God for grace. Thank God I don't have to worry whether I'm in or I'm out. Amen. I'm in. Amen. He chose me. You ever be, you, you, you ever, you ever, were you ever in elementary school and they chose sides? You were probably chosen first. I hope you weren't chosen last. Probably not. But have you ever been there? And you're standing in that, in that infamous line. And the two best kids in school are choosing. And you're standing there with your pigtails. And they start going down the line and choosing Billy and Bobby and Jimmy and Sue. And they're starting to choose. Listen, Jesus chose you. He looked at you and all of your muck and all of your mind. He knew you couldn't kick a kickball for anything. 
He knew you were going to strike out anyway. He knew that you had all kinds of problems, and yet he didn't choose you last. He didn't choose you in the middle. He chose you first. Hallelujah. He said, I'll take that one right there. Nobody else wants that one. I'll take that one right there. Yeah, that one's on my side. I choose him. I choose her. Woo, hallelujah. That made me, that made me feel good when... Come on now, you know what I'm talking? Are you with me? Somebody say amen. So the grace of God saves. Some say the grace of God saves. Secondly, the grace of God strengthens. It strengthens. You see, we're saved by the grace of God and we are kept by the grace of God. Grace means God loves you just the way you are. And that he loves you too much to let you stay that way. Love the way you're shouting. God loves you just the way you are. Turn to your neighbor and tell him, God loves me just the way I am. Isn't that, isn't that easy to say? God loves me just the way I am in my sin, in my problems, in my, in, my, in, in my junk, in my garbage. God loves me just, and thank God he does. Listen, there's nothing you can do today that would make God love you any more than he loves you. Oh, man, I got one Amen. There is nothing you can do today. You can come to the church. You can, you can win the lottery, and you can come and repent of your gambling and give the church all the money. <laughs> but God wouldn't love you anymore. Then he loves you right now. He just loves you. You can stop doing all the stuff that you're doing. God wouldn't love you anymore. T today, he, today he loves you as much as he's ever going to love you. So God loves you. I think they asked Billy Graham or, or, or one of those preachers that had been preaching for, you know, forever. And they asked him, they said, Brother Graham, I think it was Brother Graham, I'm not sure. Is it Brother Graham or one of those guys that, that, that's in his league? And they said, Brother Graham, tell me, what's the deepest theological concept that you have ever come across in these 50 or 60 years of preaching? And he said, Jesus loves me, this I know. For the Bible tells me so. Everything that you ever needed to learn, you learned in Sunday school. Jesus loves you. You remember that? Jesus loves me. This I know. For the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak. See, we, we, we think that's just for Sunday school. No, man. That's for life. Amen. He's got the whole world in his. How come you forget that all the time? How come you act like you've got the whole world in your hands? You should, you should be singing, I've got the whole world on my shoulders. No. Everything you needed to learn, everything you needed to know, you learned it in Sunday school. And the fact of the matter is, Jesus loves me, this I know. But the, but, but the fact of the matter is, he loves you just the way you are, but he loves you too much to let you stay that way. You ever heard of the law of first mention? It's a theological term. It's called the law of first mention. Now, the law of first mention is very important when you study the Bible because when God first mentions something in the Bible, you need to study that out because it's very important. Their God is laying down principles for you to learn, for you to study, for you to examine that you might understand because the law of first mention is foundational. When God first mentions something, Concerning worship, for instance, in the, in, in the book of Genesis, the Bible says of worship that it was first mentioned when Abraham turned to his servant and he said, the lad and I, you stay here, the lad and I, talking about Isaac, will go up yonder and worship. And what was he doing? He was going up to sacrifice, which helps us understand that, sacri that worship is to be sacrifice. It's not just a song we sing, but it's something we do. Worship ought to cost us something. David said, I will not offer unto the Lord that which costs me nothing. And so that, in the law of first mention, you study that. Well, today as we take a look at the law of first mention, where is grace first mentioned? 
Well, Genesis chapter 6 and verse 8 is where the, the law of first mention comes in. The Bible says, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Somebody say that with me. Noah found grace in the eyes of God. Now, how is the grace of God exhibited in Noah's life? Well, you know the story. In Noah's time, the, 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 the thoughts of men was evil continually. God said, I am going to destroy man. So he came to Noah, and he had Noah build an ark. And then in Genesis chapter 7, verse 1, the grace of God is exhibited unto Noah when God said, Noah, come thou. Some say, come thou. And all thy house into the ark. Say it with me. Come thou and all thy house into the ark. Let's pretend this is the ark. Now, if God is speaking to Noah... And God says to Noah, come thou into the ark. What does that suggest? It suggests that it was by invitation. Are you with me? But not only does it suggest that it was by invitation, it suggests that God is in the ark. If God were sitting out there, he would say, go thou into the ark. He doesn't say go thou into the ark. He says come thou into the ark. So what does God do? God in grace invites man to come where he is. God is inviting you to come where he is. That's what grace is all about. Come up a little bit higher. Come up a little bit safer. Come into the ark of safety. And as, as Noah comes in, what does the Bible say? And the Lord shut him in. Look, Noah didn't shut himself in. Noah didn't latch the door. Noah didn't shut the door. The Bible says that God shut him in. And God, that, that word literally means sealed him in. That's why the Bible says in the New Testament that we've been given a seal, which is the Holy Spirit, and we've been sealed by the power of God. So what did God do? God said, son, build the ark. Come on in where I'm at. He shut him in, and then the rains came, and the floods came, and it destroyed everything that was in the ark, but it didn't destroy Noah and his family, and that is what grace is all about. Listen, I'm here to say, did, 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 did Noah have some hard times on the ark? Noah might even have fallen down in the ark. Listen, just because you're in grace doesn't mean you don't fall down. I said just because you're in grace doesn't mean you don't have some, some rough times sometime and question where in the world is God. Just because you're in grace, it doesn't mean you're not going to have any problems. It means you're going to have some problems, but you're safe inside the ark. Hallelujah. And if I fall, that doesn't mean anything. I'm just going to get back up because I'm safe. I'm sealed. I'm secure within the ark. The ark is all around me, and I am inside the ark. Jesus is all around me, and I'm inside Jesus. Hallelujah. In him I have life. In him I have peace. In him I have joy. In him I have strength. I am in him, and he surrounds me. So the grace of God teaches us to deny ungodliness. It is God that works in me, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So if I'm in Jesus, and Jesus is in me, and I've been sealed with the Holy Spirit, that, does, that mean I can, does that mean I can't get off the ark? I can get off the ark if I'm dumb. Some people say, once you're in grace, you're always in grace. Listen, Noah could have jumped out the boat. He 
would have been stupid. Well, I just don't like what's going on in here. I, I had a fight with my wife. I'm going to jump ship. If I were in the ship, I'd be saying, Noah, you're going to die. Noah, don't jump ship. But I'm tired of my sons. He could have jumped out. And he would have died. But you'd be stupid to jump out. And it takes a lot of work to jump out. Hello? Listen, it takes a lot of work to backslide. It takes stupidity to backslide. Yeah, you can jump off the boat if you want to, and God's not going to keep you on the boat, but you would be dumb to get out of the boat. Are you with me? There's a lot of room on the boat. You don't like somebody in the boat? Go to the other side of the boat. If you don't like the way you're looking at go to the other side and just stay over here. But stay in the boat. Stay worshiping God. Stay in his safety. But the grace of God comes, and it teaches us to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts and to live soberly, righteously, and godly in this world. You see, the, say, the grace of God, it, it doesn't just save us, but it strengthens us and it secures us because the grace of God is a teacher. It's a schoolmaster. It comes to you and it teaches you the difference between right and wrong. It takes you by the hand and it says, come, join me. Stay away from that. Watch out for her. <laughs> Beware of this. Don't watch that. <laughs> and the grace of God comes and it teaches us. If you will listen to the spirit of God, he will work the grace of God into your life, even if you don't want it. Because my Bible says it is God that works in me. I'm trying to work it in you. I used to watch my mama knead bread. She was working that yeast in. So it is God that works in us both to will and to do of his good pleasure. See, Michael may not even want to do it. Michael may want to say, Jesus, I don't care. I'm just going to do my own thing. I'm going to be who I want to be. I'm going to do what I want to do. The world is saying I'm an alcoholic, then I'm an alcoholic. The world is saying I'm a homosexual, then I'm a homosexual. World is saying I'm a lesbian, then I'm a lesbian. World is saying this, then I'm that. World is, world is telling me that I'm this. So I might as well agree with the world. I might as well accept it. And Jesus, I don't even want to be what you want me to be. But the Holy Spirit is. He's not going to let you go. <laughs> Come on, you know what I'm talking about, right? Thank God for the Holy Ghost. Amen. He's not going to let us be deceived. He's not going to let us go down a path of hell. He's not going to let us be sucked into the world system. But the Bible says, be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is the good, the acceptable, and the perfect will of God. You see, the world will tell you one thing, but the Bible tells you another thing. And you need to decide, am I going to listen to what the world says? Or am I going to listen to what God says? God says I'm chosen. God says I'm holy. God says I'm pure. God says I'm him. But God, I don't want to listen to that. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, it's like, like the prodigal son. 
You come to your, to your senses. To your, the Bible says he came to himself. That's right. Just keep saying amen. He came to himself. And as he came to himself, all of a sudden it dawned on him, how stupid am I? Hello? How? I'm hurting the boy's feelings. How stupid, how dumb, how ridiculous. God, I'm not willing. But God, I'm willing to be willing. Have you ever got to that point where you say, God, I'm not willing. I don't care. I don't want it. But God, I'm willing to be made willing. And so, God, I'm just willing to be made willing. And so if you want to make me willing, then you just come on in and make me willing. The moment you say, I'm willing to be made willing, the Holy Spirit comes in and he begins to do what he does best. And it is God that works in us both to will and to do of his good pleasure. It's not of you. It's by the power of God that you're able to do what God. And the fact that you're in church this morning, it means that God is working in your life both to will and to do of his good pleasure. You're not here by mistake this morning. You thought your mama invited you. You thought your, 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 your wife invited you. You thought somebody else, but no, no, no. God picked you up by the nap of the neck and he said, there's something you need to hear about the grace of God today. It's not what you do or what you don't do. You need to realize it's me working in you both to will and to do. I brought you here. I've got a plan for you. I'm for you. And if I'm for you, who can be against you? Come on, somebody. Bless the Lord up in this place. Thank you, Michael. Give him a hand. It's a teacher. Somebody say the the, the grace of God's a teacher. God comes in, and God teaches us to say no. Some of you just need to say no. No. See, that's your problem. You haven't been taught to say no. You say no. <laughs> no. I don't think I need that beer. No, 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 no. Don't need a choke. No. Next time it comes around. No, 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 no. Yeah. You dummy. You ought, you don't, you don't say no, no, no. You say no, I'm a man of God. I'm filled with the Holy Ghost. I used to walk like that, but I don't do it. Hey, hey I've been born again by the power of God. I don't need that to get high. I'm already high. I'm seated together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. I don't need some cheap substitute to get me high. I already got the highest high you can ever get on the scale of high dumb. I just made up a word. Somebody say no! 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 Turn to your neighbor and tell him no! No! See, some of you still haven't, you're sitting here. (laughs) You gotta learn to say no. The Bible says it teaches us to say no to ungodly lusts and live righteously, soberly. I better hurry up. Somebody say no! So, it, so, so, so the grace of God saves us, it strengthens us, and then finally, it sustains us. Some say it sustains us. Where do you see that? 
Listen, there is nothing in the world around you that God's grace is not sufficient for. Let me say that again. There is nothing in the world around you that God's grace is not sufficient for. John 16, Jesus said, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. Listen to this. In the world, you will have trouble. Come on. Some say trouble. That's, a, that's an interesting word, that word trouble. It's the word polypsis. And it literally means, Paul used it, it means to be pressed down. It means to be stretched beyond recognition. Paul at one time received a vision from God. And the Bible says, give me the next scripture, would you, Dusty? The Bible says that this man was given a vision of God. He was taken up into the third heaven. Somebody say the third heaven. How many of you know there's more than one heaven? You say, Preacher, explain that. I, I don't get that. There are three heavens. There's the atmospheric heaven. It's where the birds fly and the clouds float. That's the atmospheric heaven. It's the place above your head. Then there's the starry heavens, which holds the universe. And then there's heaven, the heaven that God is in, the heaven that he has his throne in, the heaven that 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands say. And so there are three heavens. Some say three heavens. The Bible tells us that Paul was taken into the third heaven. And he says, I saw things that I cannot repeat. I saw things that I can't describe. I I was taken into the heaven of heavens and I saw the throne. I saw, I saw, I saw things that, that, that I can't share with you. Then he says, lest I be exalted above measure because of the abundance of revelations given me. In other words, he's saying, except unless I be, be lifted up with pride, spiritual pride, he says, I was given a thorn in my flesh, messenger of Satan. Three times I pleaded with God to take it from me. Some say it was his eyesight. Some say it was a sickness. Some say it was something else. We really don't know what that thorn in the flesh was. We don't know what that messenger was. But he came before God and he said, God, take it away. God, please take it away. God, take it away. Three times he asked. And God said this, my grace is sufficient for you. Paul in another, in another time, I, let me see if I, can, if, if I can get it. Paul in another place said this in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. He said, we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, about the troubles. Some say the troubles. In this world, Jesus said, you shall have trouble. Some say trouble. That word is the same word that's used here. We don't want you to be uninformed, brothers and sisters, 2 Corinthians 1, 8, about the troubles we experienced. Now listen to this. Now he's describing the trouble. We were under great pressure. Some say pressure. Far beyond our ability to endure. Some say past endurance. So he had pressure. It was beyond endurance so that we despaired of life itself. And the word despaired literally has an idea that he thought about suicide. You're saying the man of God thought about suicide? He said, I despaired of life. Some commentators will say that he was thinking about, about checking out. So what's, 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 what's Paul saying? Paul saying, look, man, I've been stretched. I've been under pressure. I've been under pressure like nobody's been under pressure. I was under such pressure, I thought, I thought about checking out. I thought about giving up. You, you, you thought, hey, have you ever felt like giving up? Man is quiet in this place. 
You ever felt like throwing in the towel? God, I'm done. I'm out of here. Let me just, let me just wave the white flag. You ever been there? Man, I've been there. Under such pressure, under such stress, under such strain. God, I don't have what it takes to be married. I'm out of here. God, I don't, want, I don't have what it takes to handle this man. God, you take my children or I'll kill them. <laughs> We've never been that far. At least I haven't. I said that the wrong way. I mean, at least she hasn't. <laughs> What's he saying? He's saying, I felt like checking out. I felt like giving up. There's an old Spanish proverb that says, there's no home without a hush. And that every home has its hush. And I think that's true in every one of our homes. And if you haven't had a hush in your home, then one day you will have a hush in your home. What's a hush? A hush is when it's quiet and you're sitting in darkness and nobody feels like talking because you can't believe that what just happened happened. You can't believe that who just died died. You can't believe the news you just got from the, from the doctor. You can't believe the news you just got from the neighbor. You can't believe and you sit there and you stare at the wall. You want to close the shades. And in that time, there are people who say, well, no, God's grace isn't sufficient for me. Uh Uh-uh. Because, Pastor, you don't know what I've gone through. You don't know what I'm going through. And the Scripture says God's grace is sufficient for me. But I don't think it's going to be sufficient. I don't think it's sufficient for me. And I don't think if I ever went through that, it would be sufficient for me. Listen. Don't go around like a minnow in the Atlantic Ocean Worrying that the ocean's going to evaporate. Some people are like that, right? I, if I ever go, th- I don't know that I could go through that. Listen, if you go through it, God says, my grace will be sufficient for you. It was sufficient for him. It was sufficient for her. It was sufficient for them. And it will be sufficient for you. If you have to go through something, listen, God's grace will undergird you. And God's grace will strengthen you. And it will sustain you. But, I, 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 but, but, Pastor, I've seen, guys, I've seen guys go through some stuff, and they've just become hard. Yeah, they have. Have you ever seen it? Have you seen it? I've seen people go through stuff. I've seen, I've seen people go through the same thing in the same family. They go through a death. They go through a, they go through a bankruptcy. They go through something that they think God should have got them out of. I'm sure Paul could have said, God, you're supposed to get me out of this. I'm your boy. God, I wrote over half the New Testament. God, you need to get me out of this. God didn't bring him out, didn't get him. See, there are some things that God will not get you out of. I hate to tell you that. I wish I, as a pastor, I could just tell you that whatever you get into, God's going to take you out. You're not going to have any troubles, but that's not the testimony of Scripture. Testimony of Scripture is that Paul had to go through it. And that sometimes you'll have to go through stuff. And I've seen people go through stuff and and people think that God ought to get them out of the situation. And one person over here gets hard. And one person over here learns and grows and becomes more like Jesus. And this person becomes more gracious and more loving and more kind and more empathetic and knows that They can minister to people because of the things that they've gone through. And this person over here becomes hard and calloused and hateful and bitter and angry. Now, how is it that one can become bitter and one can can, can become gracious? One can become bitter, one can become better. I think the reason is because the, the rain falls on the just and on the unjust. And God, God and, and, and it depends on if we understand and lay hold of the grace of God. Whew. Let me say that again. 
Hebrews chapter 12, we talked about it last week, about the discipline of God. You read a bit further, and you know what it says? Hebrews chapter 12, it says this. Take heed, lest any of you fail of the grace of God. I think the message says, lest any of you fall short of the grace of God, and thereby a root of bitterness rise up that defiles many. Here's a man over here that didn't reach out and grab the grace of God. Here's a man over here that fell short of the grace of God. He didn't utilize the grace of God. For had he utilized the grace of God and drawn from the grace of God and looked to the grace of God, he would have been over on this side and he would have said, Yea, though the Lord slay me, yet will I trust him. You see, that is Job's testimony. He laid hold of the grace of God. And although he went through hell, He said, though the Lord slay me, yet will I trust him. See, you may not be able to understand what God is up to. There'll be times when you can't fathom what God is doing. But listen, when you cannot trace God's hand, you can trust God's heart. Because somebody said God is too good to be cruel and he's too wise to make mistakes. See, one of these days, it's going to be over. Honey, 50 years from now, hopefully you'll still be here. But I won't. Unless we come up with some crazy medicine that makes me live to be 120. 50 years from now, Don, chances are, chances are we're going to be hunting in heaven. I don't know if we can, because there's going to be no more death over there. We'll just have to hit them, and then they take off, and we'll go shoot them again. (laughs) He said, I do that now. (laughs) You don't get a good enough shot, they'll take off. Fifty years from now, it's going to be over. They're going to take us, and they're going to put us in a casket. They're going to talk about, they're going to mention our names in hushed tones. Our friends and our family are going to gather together at the cemetery. And if we're lucky, we'll have some people stand up and say some good things about us. They'll carry us out to the graveyard and the preacher will say those words, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. We commit this ground to the, to this body to the ground from whence it came. And that's it. It's all going to be over. 50 years from now, 60 years from now, death's going to rattle in your throat. Your feet are going to grow cold. And you're going to slip from time into eternity. And my question is, when it gets to that point, you stand before God as all of us will. Will we need grace? Will we have grace? I didn't preach this message for no reason. God told me to tell you about grace because that day is coming. And it's coming soon. Coming for every one of you young people. And it may come before 50 years. You may get in a car today and not make it home. Hit by some drunk driver or something. But my Bible says in Ephesians 2, 7, that God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in heavenly places in order that in the coming ages, what are you talking about the coming ages? I'm talking about when you and I gather before God and we stand before him in the coming ages. Why did God raise us up in Christ? The Bible says we've been raised up and seated in heavenly realms in Christ. Why? So that in the Coming ages, he might show the incomparable riches of his grace. See, on that day, the only thing that's going to matter is God's grace. Have you been saved by grace? Have you been strengthened by grace? Are you being sustained by grace? Have you welcomed and embraced the grace of God? Are you running from God's grace? 
See, the grace of God is going to sustain you, my friend. And it's going to help you to face that moment, not just with, not just with courage, but with joy. As you step from time into eternity. And it's the grace of God that's going to take you from here. It's going to keep you till the end. So that when you die, you can die gracefully. So it's the grace of God that will sustain you. It's the grace of God that will strengthen you. So that you don't fall between now and then. For it's by grace that you've been saved. Through faith. Now what's going to keep you from the grace of God? Can I tell you? This is it. There's only one thing that's going to keep you from the grace of God. James tells us, James chapter 4, verse 6, that God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. So you need the grace of God today. You'll need the grace of God tomorrow. And you'll especially need the grace of God when you stand before him, and you will. And the only thing that's going to keep you from God's grace right now, honey, sir, the only thing that's going to keep you from the grace of God is our stubborn pride that says, I can do it by myself. I don't need God's mercy. I don't need God's grace. I can do it my way. Listen, whatever you do, don't choose pride. Kick pride in the teeth today and embrace humility. And say with everybody in this room, say with this preacher, God, I can't do it. I need your mercy. I need your grace. Would you bow your heads with me?